island of Valkren, just part of devastated Holland, or rather what remains of it above water after the dikes have been breached and the battle had passed on. Four-fifths of the island are under the sea, the North Sea whose tides race through the kitchens and the parlors, the salt eating at the brickwork, picking out the plaster. Salt water killing slowly but surely, killing the low pastures and the fruit trees in the orchards. The sea sweeps relentlessly backwards and forwards through the breached dikes. Only shrubs growing on the canal banks mark what was once the great waterway from Flushing to Middleburg. And Middleburg itself is now a tidal Venice with water pouring down streets and eddying in the alleyways. Middleburg, the prosperous city, which in peacetime was the natural capital of the island, the link with the Dutch mainland. Holland, like Britain, depended largely on imported corn and cattle cake. It could not grow enough to support itself, but Valkren was one of the richest and most fertile parts of Holland. These dikes were the careful work of centuries. The job of keeping them in good repair employed whole villages like West Capella. For seamen going up the Scheldt to Antwerp, West Capella Lighthouse was a famous landmark. Valkren had a superb system of canals. The fields were heavy with corn, and its dairy produce was some of the best in Holland. Flour from the Valkren mills fed the people of The Hague in Amsterdam, but in autumn 1944, Antwerp, 60 miles up the Scheldt to the southeast of Valkren, became the vital port for Allied operations. But Valkren, commanding the mouth of the Scheldt, was heavily fortified by the Germans with powerful coastal batteries. No Allied ships, no supplies could reach the all-important port of Antwerp until the guns were silenced. The only course was to bomb the dikes of Valkren and flood out the Nazis. This was the price of liberation, and for the people of Valkren, it was a heavy price. In West Capella alone, 200 people were killed or drowned. They took the women and children out first, loaded aboard whatever they could. With that sudden inrush of water, it was hard to choose what was essential at a moment's notice. They made for the high ground, the little islands of safety, those villages which were only partly flooded. But these were already packed out. 20 to 30 people living in the upper story of a flooded cottage. They had to turn the churches into rest centers. They lived and slept on the pews. The old church stove they used as a kitchen range. These dike workers sitting here have lost everything their homes, their possessions, and in many cases, those they love. They saved all the root crops they could and brought them to the high ground, but they needed careful attention because the salt water turned them rotten. The precious cattle, men from the Dutch resistance, drove them up onto the high sand dunes where there was at least some fodder. But the dunes were sown with mines, and any cows that strayed were blown up. They had to be carefully guarded, and it was obvious that there would not be enough fodder to last for long. The quality of milk grew worse and worse. Some of the cattle they slaughtered immediately. For a time, there was a glut of meat on this island. And while in the rest of Holland, people were dying of starvation, here a double quantity of meat was given for each ration card. The deadly action of salt water soon showed on livestock. The horses started dying. The flood water became foul and infected. Cuts festered. People wading through the water developed ulcers on their feet and legs. The Germans took every boat they could. Any and every means of transport had to be used. Very few people had gumboots, and they could only cross the roads at low tide. Few places had lighter power, and even fewer any drinking water except what rain they could collect. 
Evacuation from the island was essential. Burgomasters and doctors prepared the registers. Only essential people, such as dike workers, could remain on the island. It was remarkable how many people tried to prove they were essential. Then officers of the Dutch and British civil affairs went out in boats and ducks to fetch the people. Each evacuee was allowed to pick out some 400 weight of personal belongings, such as clothing, beds, food and coal, to be sent after them. And naturally, they wore all their petticoats. This looks just like a flooded country lane. And in a sense, it is a country lane sown with mines which will explode as the boats run aground, as they may at low tide. But it is now also part of the North Sea with currents and tides which vary according to the direction of the wind. All the evacuees were taken first to Middleburg. these farming people, their livestock were as important as their own lives. They were driven to Vera and shipped off as quickly as possible to dry pastures on the mainland. carts or on foot, from all outlying villages came little parties collecting together to save shipping, not knowing when they would return, knowing only that the lands they tilled were ruined, and when at last they did come back, it would be to find trees dead and houses derelict. miles away, Dutchmen dying on three ounces of bread a day. No meat, no fats, but also no floods, and houses and plenty of fresh water. And here, not enough drinking water, but sufficient to eat, and nowhere to live. Every convoy of boats had to have a pilot who knew the depth of the water, where the canals were, what roads were clear of mines, and how the tides were running with the wind prevailing. Middleburg, too, had its share of flooding, and its normal population of 18,000 swelled to 40,000. Each village of Valken was adopted by a village on South Bevelin, or the mainland, so that even away from home they were able to stay together. It was possible to get along the dike across to the mainland, and many of the evacuees were transferred from boat to lorry, and then driven off. The war swept on towards Germany, and the bombers which had changed the face of Valkyrie in the night now wrote victory and reassurance across the sky. But even the children, as they stood watching, thought, how long, how long before the end will the Germans blow the dikes of the Zyder Zee? Will anybody be still living in Amsterdam when it's free? There were still thousands to be evacuated from Valken, and to their aid came the amazing duck. 
as many people could crowd into one dock as into half a dozen rowing boats. evacuated the northern part of the island, but it was not plain sailing because the Germans still held Skowen, an island only seven miles to the north, on which they had heavy coastal batteries. These ducks got through, but others were not so lucky, and the route had to be abandoned. Meanwhile, the men and women, who have been fortunate enough to remain behind, search the debris for anything they can salvage. The rubbish of yesterday is today's treasure. Life has gone back to what they now think of as normal, strange, nightmare, post-war normal in which children make their own boats out of German K-Pok mattresses. And families live in the pillboxes which were to guard Hitler's empire for a thousand years. It will be three years after the land is drained of salt water before it will yield crops. Ten years before trees will grow. They can prevent the sea from making fresh inroads, but they have nothing with which to repair the breaches in the dikes. The time will come, and not so distantly, when they will ask us for the pumps, the pile drivers, the bulldozers and machinery to liberate their land again, this time from the sea. Mm -hmm. 